Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Doug Heath from SAS Canola. Welcome back from the networking session. And the next one will be available at the end of the talks this afternoon. All of the networking sessions can be accessed through the main lobby of the Canola Week website. On behalf of the planning committee, we appreciate everyone setting aside some time and attention for attending these sessions this afternoon. I would like to remind everyone that you can type a question into the Q&A window at any time during these presentations. And there will be a single combined live Q&A session at the end of the afternoon at 3.30 Central Standard Time. And the 14 speakers will be answering those questions live at that time. So to begin our crop updates and report session, our first speaker is Corey Jacob from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture to give us a prairie wide crop report. All right, hello everybody. This is my 2020 uh, Prairie Provincial Canola Crop Report that I was asked to give. Um, this will be covering Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba and we're gonna start and go from west to east to be fair. So uh, 2020 canola crop summary from Stats Canada. Um, we had seen about 5.8 million, 5.9 million acres of total seeded acreage, um, just shy of 5.9 million. Um, th that's a slight change from 2019 and an 8.5% lower than the five-year average. An average yield of 45.4 bushels an acre, which is quite good. And that's up 12.7% from 2019 and up 8.3% from the five-year average and 5.9 million metric tons of production, which is about 31% of Canada's uh, canola production from Alberta and up significantly uh, at 12% from 2019 and just below the five-year average, but quite, quite on par with that. Uh, just a reminder that we had quite difficult um, harvesting conditions in, 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 the, uh, in the fall of 2019 with, uh, in, in Alberta, and that's seen in the amount of canola that was left to be spring combined, um, seeing 23% in the northeast, 58% uh, in the northwest, and 76% in the peace. Um, about a third of the, canola Alberta, of the canola in Alberta was left to be spring combines. Just a reminder about the difficult conditions that were, were seen. Um, moisture situation, they started off not too bad in, in Alberta, a fair bit of good, uh, fair to good to excellent um, to excessive moisture. And then as we got farther into July, um, definitely seeing uh, moisture increasing um, in the south, which is great that they're not normally um, in that situation. And then the north, um, northeast, northwest and the Peace region, um, definitely improving to excessive moisture, which might have impacted some, uh, some drown out acres or uh, seeding of canola. I do want to also thank Keith Gabbert with the Canola Council uh, for giving me some information, saying that it was a relatively uneventful year. Um, yields were quite variable across the province, maybe some disappointments. Um, the South was quite happy with their canola yields because they had experienced some dry conditions in the previous years. Um, other than that, uh, pest issues, just some flea beetle issues in the spring um, and some late season uh, Bertha armyworm spraying in the Peace region. But other than that, uh, not a, a very uneventful year um, in, in Alberta. So I want to thank Keith for a little bit of information there. Um, <clears throat> this is their Alberta Canola Disease Survey. Uh, thanks to Mike Harding and his group for providing this. Now, this is um, not quite the full data set. It's incomplete. Um, they're still analyzing the, the data, but they surveyed clubroot, black lake, sclerotinium, verticillium, uh, clubroot, for prevalence and incidence along with black leg and sclerotinian verticillium was more of a presence um, absence. And we see a uh, club root with about 15% prevalence and uh, with about 5% incidence, black leg about 44% prevalence, about 5% incidence as well. And sclerotinia uh, quite low um, prevalence and incidence and verticillium <clears throat> very, very low prevalence and no data on incidence. That's a very quick overview of the of the Alberta uh, canola situation. Uh, moving on to Saskatchewan, uh, from Stats Canada, we have 11.3 million um, million acres seeded to to canola 2020, down from 2019 by 3.7%, down from the five year average as well by 4.4%, a 39.6 average yield, the bushels an acre average yield, which is still respectable, but down from uh, from 2019 and the five year average and 10.1 uh, million metric tons produced, which is just over half of Canada's canola production. And that's down 8.7% from 2019 and 6.2%, down 6.2% from the five-year average. 
So on this graph, we can see insured canola acres across Saskatchewan, really just showing it's grown everywhere. In some areas, we're having um, a million acres plus production um, or just shy of a million acres. And even in our, our drier areas of the province, we're seeing production as well, you know, uh, definitely multiple thousand acres in, in, in all areas of the province. So for the, uh, the moisture situation in Saskatchewan, we started off with pretty good um, subsoil moisture or topsoil moisture. Um, we, we had good fall rains to, to get us there, but that did impact our harvesting and having to do some, some spring harvesting as well. Um, we did see some definitely, you know, rain in the spring more than we've seen in the past, but that did lead to some issues with crop emergence um, as well, because some of those rains weren't getting to everybody. Um, but overall, a better spring than we'd experienced in previous years. And when we fast forward to, say, June 22nd, um, across the province, mostly adequate for moisture. When we get to the central or the east central northeast regions, short to very short, and the west central as well, they were um, very, very short on rainfall and could use anything they could get. When we moved to Saskatchewan uh, farther into the growing season, we were still receiving rainfall across the province, but really it was kind of just keeping up to, to crop demand, maybe even a bit less than that. Um, the majority of the rainfall that was, you know, excess was kind of being given in the northeast and northwest regions and maybe even part of the west central. Um, but we, we had experienced a, a very, uh, about three, two to three weeks in July of, of, of hot and dry weather that really dried us out in the province. That really impacted our yields as we had seen with a, a bit of a lower canola yield than, uh, than, than our previous years. And going into fall here as of October 19th, the majority of the province is short to very short on uh, topsoil moisture. Um, adequate only really in kind of the, the far northeast, north central, northwest, maybe even west central, but the rest of the province could use a, a good shot of moisture in any shape, shape or form. I'm going to discuss the 2020 general canola disease survey as well. Um, 250 fields were done in the province in 2020. I'm going to uh, be presenting data on 131 of those fields. So just over half have been kind of analyzed and, and entered so far. And these were rated for uh, prevalence, incidence, and severity. And this is a permission, um, a produce, the fields are surveyed with producer permission is what I'm meaning to say. So for sclerotinia, we saw a 70% prevalence of, of uh, of sclerotinia um, in, in surveyed fields. And then for incidents, we saw 21% of plants um, in affected fields had sclerotinia stem rot symptoms. Um, and average incidence was 14% when average, when average across all surveyed fields. Uh, regionally across the province, we're seeing it in, in all regions, 100% um, prevalence in the Northwest. Um, incidence, about 25% maybe. Um, and then we see a lower, uh, the lowest, uh, prevalence was the, the southeast at about 55% with maybe two or 3% incidence, but it is definitely found in all regions of the province. When we look uh, back from 1999, we can see the incidence of sclerotinia in the province, and it has, um, it's quite variable with, with the environmental and moisture conditions. And we can see we're starting to see a bit of a tick up in incidence uh, from, from the past few years for sclerotinia. When we look at black league, we had a 78% prevalence across the province. Um, incidents, we're seeing an average of 17% of plants surveyed in infected fields had symptoms of black league. And when averaged across all surveyed fields, about a 13% incidence. So still um, a fair bit of black league found this year as well. And it is, it's present in the province. Um, when we look across all regions, we're seeing 40% uh, prevalence in the Northeast, about nine or 10% incidence, and then you know uh, upwards of 90 plus percent prevalence in the East Central, West Central, Southeast, with about maybe you know teens for incidence, 10 to 15%, maybe a bit higher um, across regions in the province. So definitely seeing Black Lake um, present across the province um, and and showing its 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 head again. Um, for Black Lake incidents in Saskatchewan, as we can see over the number of years, we've seen it um, gradually increase and we're seeing a little more of an increase with it as well, but I think we're still managing it quite well, but we're still gradually seeing how it has um, increased over the last number of years in the province. And other diseases, Astra yellow is present in 33% of fields, Alternaria black spot in 85% of fields, uh, symptoms matching verticillium stripe found in three fields, and symptoms consistent with gray stem observed in two fields. 
and our our, um, our our results of our club route survey will are still being analyzed for the 2020 survey, and we'll be having results available uh, with the updated map in January of 2021. I can say we are finding more more fields as we go on, unfortunately, but I don't think anybody would be overly surprised by that. Summary of Manitoba for for 2020: uh, 3.4 uh, million acres ceded to canola. Uh, up 3% from 2019, up 4.7% from the five-year average, 41.7 bushel and acre average yield, um, slightly down from 2019, up a little bit from the five-year average, 3.1 million metric tons of production, about 16% of Canada's canola production from Manitoba. Production is up from 2019 by 3.5% and uh, um, up 5.5% from the five-year average. I do want to thank Dane uh, Froze, my counterpart in Manitoba, for helping me with some information and slides for this presentation. It was a very large and appreciated help, and I want to really acknowledge his contribution to this. Um, Manitoba experienced a, a growing season similar to, to Saskatchewan and, and Alberta, where we saw our, um, you know, excess rainfall, uh, severe in some situations and frequent in others. Um, you know, hot and dry area in the interlake and actually some late, se late season grasshopper infestations. But as we look from May to June to July, we can see how the season unfolded. We, we were seeing areas that were drier and some areas that were experiencing um, <clears throat> excess moisture. Uh, canola overview for the year uh, in Manitoba, we had slow delayed growth in the spring, particularly in the southwest where we had, um, you know, experienced some cold and spotty issues, maybe some dryness preventing uniform emergence, maybe some producers chasing moisture and seeding a little bit too deep. Um, feed beetle issues again causing a, some, some issues with reseeding, uh, patchy uh, rainfall distribution leading to varied yields, and uh, notably black leg and verticillium wilt showing up a bit uh, heavier this year. Uh, receded acres, 1,100 claims in 2020, about 187,000 receded acres in Manitoba due to dry soils, frost, and flea beetle pressure. Uh, average yield of about 41.7 bushels an acre, like I had mentioned, which is still respectable, quite good actually. 96% um, of early uh, samples graded number one, Canada from the Canadian Grain Commission Harvest Sample Program. Lowest green seed count among prairie provinces, no significant quality issues in Manitoba, and a 43.7% mean oil content. When we look at canola acres and yields uh, going back to 2020, I know Dane and I have a little bit different numbers there from Stats Canada and his sources, but um, I think we can still say, you know, 3.3, 3.4 million acres in that range, up a fair bit over the last number of years, and really a... Um, a decreasing yield from what producers have been enjoying for the last number of years, but still, uh, you know, a higher yield than they had seen in 2016 and 14 and 12, and still quite on par. I mean, still a very respectable, good yield, but seeing that the acreage has increased in the yield uh, off a little bit from some of the drier conditions. When we look at a variety acreage comparison that Dana provided, um, we're seeing the acres, the canola acres in Manitoba, really dominated by the Liberty Link glufosinate tolerant hybrids, um, and then some of the Roundup Ready as well, rounding it off. I do want to note as well that a lot of those hybrids are um, uh, pod shatter resistant, so a lot of that is really taking off with producers, and I think they're seeing the benefits of of growing varieties that they can uh, that they can straight cut as well, or have that option to do. Um, Dane had provided me with information that in 2018, about 850,000 acres were, were, were straight cut, um, 1.9 million in 2019, and 2020, about 2.5 million acres. So 2.5 million out of 3.3, 3.4 million, so a significant amount are the straight cut pot shatter tolerant varieties in, in Manitoba. <clears throat> Excuse me. For their disease survey, um, this line here, this green line, is the prevalence. So for sclerotinia, we're seeing about a 40% prevalence. And in, um, incidents, um, we're talking infested crops and all crops. Um, so in, in all crops, about 2 to 3% incidence. And then prevalence, or sorry, um, in infested crops, about 5%. So less sclerotinia this year due to the dry conditions. But a total different situation when we look at black leg. This uh, teal colored line is prevalence, about just over 80% prevalence of black leg in Manitoba in 2020. When we look at incidence in infested crops, we're just over 90% incidence in infested crops. And when we look at all crops, about maybe 75%. So a lot of black leg showed up in Manitoba in 2020. Uh, could be due to some high inoculum levels from previous years is what we're thinking. But yeah, just noting that that's, that's very high and significant. Um, 
they'll experience a fair bit of lodging and verticillium. This could be higher uh, prevalence in detection across 20, uh, Manitoba in 2020 uh, for verticillium. Um, heat and lack of moisture in July and August seem to contribute to more uh, severe symptoms of, of lodging and verticillium. Uh, weakened stems could have to do with this with increased lodging in some, in some hybrids. Um, yield loss is really tough to attribute directly to verticillium longisporum. It could have been a, a combination of things going on there with lack of rainfall, disease, and late season stress. And to wrap up here, Dane just forwarded me a little bit of a, of a looking forward for canola for, for 2020. Um, he thinks canola acreage will drop slightly back to 3.25 million acres, um, increase again in straight cut varieties, and weather disruptions um, not going to affect planting intentions going forward into 2021 as much. And uh, very nice to see some significant uh, significantly more fall field work and fertilizer applications done in 2020, leading to more timely seeding expected into 2021. So that's my presentation. I know it was fast and a lot to cover. Um, I apologize if I'm over time, but it was a lot to cover and I, I hope everyone um, got some good information out of it. And uh, thanks for, uh, for the invitation to speak and enjoy the rest of the year of your afternoon. Our next speaker is, is Kelly Trickington from AAFC to give us a canola disease update for the prairies. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Kelly Turkington, and I've been asked to give you an overview of the prairie canola disease situation from the summer of 2020. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, for the presentation, and especially Mike Harding, Ali Reza Akavan, David Kaminsky, and Justine Cornelson. We're also very fortunate to have collaboration across the prairie region in terms of canola disease research and our annual surveys and diagnostic activities. We're also very fortunate to have funding from the Prairie Canola Grower Associations. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Warren Ward and the organizers and sponsors of Canola Week 2020 for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Well, let's get right into the data. In Alberta, they surveyed about 300 fields. In Saskatchewan, a total of 250 fields were surveyed but currently results are only available for 131 fields. In Manitoba, 161 fields were surveyed. So if we look at prevalence, 45% uh, of the fields surveyed in Alberta had blackleg, about 78% in Saskatchewan and 83% in Manitoba. If we look at average percent infected plants over all fields, in Alberta it was 6.4%, 13% in Saskatchewan and 19% in Manitoba. If we look at severity of black leg, the values in Alberta were 0 0.08, Saskatchewan 0 0.2, and Manitoba was 1.2. Looking at sclerotinia stem rot in Alberta, they focused on lower main stem uh, symptoms only, and about 5% of the fields in Alberta had symptoms of stem rot. In Saskatchewan, it was 70% of the fields surveyed with symptoms of stem rot, and in Manitoba, it was about 39%. In terms of average percent infected plants across fields, it was 0.7% in Alberta, 14% in Saskatchewan, and 2% in Manitoba. Unfortunately, uh, it's not possible to derive severity data for Alberta, but in Saskatchewan, the value was 0.3, and in Manitoba, it was 0.1. If we look at the other diseases that uh, pathologists monitor and extension staff, these include things like aster yellows, foot rot, <clears throat> and alternaria black spot. Uh, Mike Carding indicates that there were uh, detections of aster yellows in some Alberta fields in 2020, while in Saskatchewan, about 33% of the fields surveyed had uh, symptoms of aster yellows, while in Manitoba, only 3% of the fields had symptoms. If we look at foot rot, about 3% of the fields had symptoms in Saskatchewan. Most fields in Manitoba did not have symptoms, except in the Northwest region where about 6% of the fields had symptoms, and in the Southwest region where about 19% of the fields had symptoms. For Alternaria black spot, about 84% of the fields in Saskatchewan had symptoms, and about 17% of the fields had symptoms in Manitoba. If we look at club root in Alberta and the survey that Mike Harding uh, is responsible for, they looked at 300 fields, about 8.7% of those fields had symptoms. Average percent infected plants over all fields was about 1.8 and a fairly low severity value of 0 
Dr. Stephen Strelkoff and colleagues at the University of Alberta are also heavily involved in monitoring club root in Alberta. And if you combine the fields from Stephen with the 300 fields from Micarding, we had a total of 620 fields of canola surveyed for club root in and also an additional four mustard fields. So overall, the prevalence was about 10.6% of fields with symptoms in 2020. And uh, Dr. Stralkoff is currently working on finishing up the data analysis and tabulation. Of concern though, uh, was the fact that there were an additional 313 club root positive fields that were identified by provincial agricultural field persons in 2020. Also, we had the first confirmed club root cases in the MD of Smoky River in the Peace Region, as well as the County of uh, Grand Prairie in the Peace Region, and finally Wheatland County, which is just east of Calgary. If we look at Saskatchewan, their focus uh, is primarily on high risk club root areas, but also surveying fields in other parts of the province. More and more, they are encouraging on-farm monitoring for the club root pathogen. And this is done via club root uh, soil, their club root soil testing program. Currently, they're working through the data and completing a lot of the lab testing. And Ali Reza indicates that the club root distribution map uh, will be released in early 2021. If we look at Manitoba, they had symptomatic plants in only one of 161 fields that were surveyed, but they also observed club root in, a, in a, an additional two fields that were outside of the, the official survey. Symptomatic club root cases have been found in 44 fields across 10 rural municipalities in Manitoba since 2013. And in 2020, they've collected soil samples from 20 fields and they're currently processing those samples looking for the presence of club root pathogen DNA. If we now turn our attention to verticillium stripe, it's a disease that started to show up about five to six years ago, years ago across the Prairie region, but especially in Manitoba. In Alberta in 2020, Mike reports that they had about 1.1% of the fields with symptoms with an average percent infected plants uh, across fields of 0.2%. Uh, he did emphasize that this data is based on symptoms only and they're currently uh, conducting lab tests to confirm the presence of the verticillium stripe pathogen. In Saskatchewan, there were a few suspect cases sent to their diagnostic lab, while in Manitoba, there were many confirmed samples that were submitted to both the PSI lab and the Manitoba Crop Diagnostic Lab. In 2020, over 30% of the fields surveyed in Manitoba had symptoms of verticillium stripe, but the official number is still being confirmed via lab tests. Finally, there's significant efforts underway to develop an industry standard to rate the severity of verticillium stripe, both in commercial fields as well as research trials. And with that, I'll end there and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you for your attention. Up next is James Tanzi from the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture to give us a prairie wide report on canola pest insects. For 2020 from a Western Canadian perspective. Uh, talk a little bit about the surveys that we were conducted in 2020 and the results of some of these surveys, including diamondback moth, Earth armyworm, cabbage seed fog weevil, aster leafhopper, canola flower midge, and some other insects of interest in Western Canada, including cutworms, red bug, and flea beetles. First off, diamondback moth. Uh, surveys were conducted in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba from 45 century sites in Saskatchewan, 42 in Alberta, and 84 in Manitoba. These, of course, capture males as they arrive from southern latitudes in North America. These are captured with synthetic sex pheromones, and you can see a delta trap here with a, with a synthetic pheromone lure. These attract the males who are stuck to a glue board in the, uh, in the delta trap. So traps began to capture early May, and in Saskatchewan, we had some pretty high numbers and pretty early, uh, particularly Meadow Lake and Cadillac area. I also saw high, high numbers around Loon Lake and Indian Head, uh, and capture numbers increased on mid-June where they fell off. 
Uh, early arrival and large numbers trapped indicated the potential for uh, serious problems with Diamondback Moth, particularly in Saskatchewan. These did not materialize. We had high winds, which likely kept flight down during, during periods of overposition. Uh, there were reports of spring, uh, but uh, these were very low in Alberta and Saskatchewan and limited to a few fields in eastern and central Manitoba. Next were Bertha armyworm. These were also monitored, were monitored with pheromone traps. Once again, a synthetic uh, sex pheromone to attract males in these bucket or uni traps. Uh, we trapped early June until early August, 257 traps in Saskatchewan, 345 in Alberta, and 84 in Manitoba. Uh, we did produce maps of accumulated moth numbers and, uh, and posted these uh, both the ministry website and uh, Prairie Pest Monitoring Network. By the numbers uh, in Alberta, populations in the peas seem to be diminishing as they are throughout Saskatchewan. Uh, and in Manitoba, populations were low and below economic thresholds. Uh, insecticide applications, there were reports in Alberta in the, in the municipal districts of Spirit River and Smoky, uh, Smoky River uh, and in Birch Hills in northern Sunrise counties. In Saskatchewan, no widespread uh, reports of, uh, of spring and similarly for Manitoba. Looking at moth populations in Saskatchewan, uh, this is 2018 and you can see that uh, dispersed populations with a few hot spots. 2019, uh, really only one hot spot to talk about. Uh, maybe two if you think, uh, uh, if you look just south of North Battleford. Uh, and uh, for 2020, the, uh, the population was, uh, was quite low with really only one hot spot south of uh, Humboldt. Cabot seed pod weevil were also monitored. This is an invasive insect and uh, uh, I'll jump to the end a little bit. Numbers were low uh, in, uh, in most regions, uh, but the, uh, the distribution continues to expand. Uh, we sweep sampled for these ones in, uh, in July. In Alberta, 235 fields were hit uh, uh, and, and numbers continue to be low with very little spray. In Saskatchewan, uh, we run a transect system throughout the, uh, throughout the province. Uh, numbers again were low. We're still processing these samples and haven't produced the map yet, but uh, that work is ongoing. Uh, initial uh, uh, look at the data indicates that uh, numbers were, were very low. Uh, spraying very infrequent uh, with only one site that I know of uh, in southern Saskatchewan with, as, with uh, weevils at economic levels. In Manitoba, the weevil is now present, uh, albeit at low levels. So 26 fields hit and seven weevils from uh, all told. Canola flower midge was monitored by uh, AAFC, uh, and uh, although there were some limits to the, uh, to the to the extent of the survey imposed by COVID, they still managed to get out and do some surveying. Uh, this is monitored on field margins of canola crops. Uh, population densities were greatest in the northeast of Saskatchewan, uh, both from 2017 to 2020. This remains relatively consistent. Uh, midge symptoms were were relatively ubiquitous, uh, and this is what you're seeing circled here: these odd bell-shaped flowers. Generally low density. There was one population that was at, uh, we'll say, a putative economic level in 2019. None reported for this year. Uh, and an important consideration: this is not Swede midge. It is in the same genus, and the adults look very similar, but uh, a different species. Aster leafhopper was also monitored in Saskatchewan. Uh, important because it vectors aster yellows, and you can see symptoms of aster yellows in this photo on the right. Uh, yellow sticky cards were placed in conjunction with our diamondback moth sentry sites in Saskatchewan, and numbers continue to be low. Cutworms uh, in Alberta, relatively low incidence. Uh, in Saskatchewan, we were generally seeing red back and some pale western cutworm. Uh, we had May to June reports of damage and spraying. Uh, Manitoba, generally red back, but also some dingy cutworms and some reports of spraying and reseeding associated with these animals. The red bug was also reported in, uh, in Saskatchewan. Uh, we're not getting reports from Manitoba or Alberta in any sort of widespread uh, uh, distribution. Uh, this is a, a member of the uh, dirt colored seed bugs, Paratrichus convivus, no common name. So it's being colloquially, colloquially called uh, a red bug, although there are some other animals that are also called red bugs, just to add to the confusion. Uh, these are piercing sucking feeders. They aggregate, as you can see on this photo on the lower right, and uh, 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 nymphs tend to feed on epicotyl seedling stem and leaves. Uh, um, adults uh, tend, tend to congregate underground and can occur there just under the soil surface in very high numbers. They're thought to feed on seeds. We have two reports in seedling canola in southern Saskatchewan. 
uh, and one report uh, in a cereal crop in November in uh, in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, very odd. Uh, finally, flea beetles uh, throughout Alberta, major concern across Alberta. Uh, striped were dominant in most regions, and uh, this uh, species composition shift seems to be continuing. Crucifer still dominant in the, in the south. Same trend was uh, seen in Saskatchewan. Uh, in addition, in Saskatchewan, we had localized damage coupled with wind damage. It was a very windy spring. Uh, so we had some sandblasting uh, of, uh, of seedling canola as well. Uh, had some overspraying and reseeding associated with this in Manitoba, the Interlake, Swan Valley, uh, Dauphin, uh, Fork River, and uh, Portage Prairie and uh, Notre Dame areas with uh, uh, flea beetle damage and also some localized frost damage requiring reseeding. Fall populations of crucifer were high in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, and we're still working out any connection between fall populations and spring damage. And with that, I will take any questions. The next presentation is from Raymond Gadua from the Canola Council of Canada to give us a summary from the Western Canadian Canola and Rapeseed Recommending Committee. Hello everyone, my name is Raymond Gadwa, and I'll be providing the 2020 Western Canada Canola Rapeseed Recommending Committee Interim Report. This slide describes the, the role of uh, the Canola Council of Canada in the administration and coordination uh, of uh, canola variety recommendation in Western Canada. This slide describes the, the functions of the WCCRC, which is tasked with setting the parameters and administering the system of canola recommendation for Western Canada. CCRC, which is tasked with setting the parameters and administering the system of canola recommendation for Western Canada. This slide describes the purpose of public co-op trials, which coalesces company selections from private co-op trials into the second year co-op testing. This slide enumerates the private and public co-op testing efforts from the 2020 season. The following is a summary of second year canola cultivars entered in the 2020 trials. There's a total of 75 entries, 10 of which are stewardship entries conducted separately under company auspices pending approval of the optimum GLI trait in major markets. As you can see, seven of the 75 uh, entries are of the low linolenic type or high stability, I guess. Uh, slide number seven here indicates the distribution of second year canola recommendation trials uh, across Western uh, Canada with their zone descriptions included. This slide reveals uh, quality data from four of 16 selected uh, agronomic and quality evaluation sites uh, going from lower yielding to, to uh, higher yielding uh, locations. slide diagrams the transition of quality trait values in comparison to yield. Uh, and yield in this context is 100 kilograms per hectare or quintals per hectare from lower yielding sites to higher yielding sites. The next three slides are a brief guideline of the criteria used by the Western Canada Canola Rapeseed Recommending Committee for, for Brassica napis canola. There's a fast track option available to get a recommendation based on one year of data. This, this I'm referring to interim recommendation as we see in the first slide here. 
the stipulation is that uh, to obtain interim recommendation, you have to have a minimum of 12 station years and agree to place your entry in the second year of public co-op testing, uh, at which time it would be eligible for full recommendation. For recommendation after two years of testing, a minimum of 11 locations of yield trials and three station years of black lay data are required. Most cultivars would have 20 to 30 station years of data. The first primary criteria is the, the evaluation of urusic acid in oil of seed submitted, and the value must be less than 0.5% of the total fatty acids. Uh, the seeds must contain no more than 12 micromoles total glucosinolates per gram whole seed at 8.5% moisture or contain levels of glucosinolate not more than the mean of the designated checks for regular bean napus plus 2 micromoles. The candidates must meet the current can canola definition. Uh, Brassica gensia cultivars in second year of testing must have less than one micromole of allyl glucosinolase per gram of seed oil. Uh, for the uh, oil must content must not be lower than the mean of the unadjusted designated checks minus 0.6 percent in the zone or zones for which the candidate is being considered. Protein protein must not be lower than the mean of the designated unadjusted adjusted checks minus 0.9% in the zone or zones for which the candidate is being considered. Saturates. Total saturate fatty acids are defined as a percentage of total fatty acids, including the following, as described in the side, slide. Uh, total saturates in, uh, in cultivars must not exceed the mean of the, of the checks by the following limits. Total content must be equal to or less than the mean of the des designated unadjusted ch checks in the zone or zones for which the candidate is being considered. Thank you and have a great meeting. To close out this series is Veronique Barté from the Canadian Grains Commission. Hello, I'm very happy to present you the quality of the 2020 canal harvest. In May, a uh, producer from Alberta at the first harvest the 2019 of a winter canola and our other crop to be able to seed. Uh, but the weather condition of the spring allow all the crop to be seeded on time this year. Uh, June and August were very warm, uh, especially in um, south of Alberta, Manitoba and uh, Saskatchewan. But um, some cooler conditions were especially in the north of Alberta. Uh, September weather um, was quite nice. Um, just one frost in Manitoba that didn't really affect the quality of the crop. And by end of October, all harvest was completed. This map actually is a good indication of what the quality is going to be. This is the number of the um, over 30 degrees Celsius for um, mainly um, July and August. And we can see that actually the prairies are cut in two. Um, the lowest part of the prairie, the south of the prairie, um, big part of um, Manitoba and Saskatchewan, and also south of Alberta with um, very high temperature and a large number of days with over 30 degrees temperatures, whereas the north of the prairies were actually um, much cooler. As of November 16, we received um, just over 2,000 samples of uh, conventional canola, and um, that's a good indication that, first of all, the crop was harvested on time, and um, that the data presented here actually are quite reflective of the um, entire harvest. We had about 92% of the crop that was uh, graded number one, which was um, due to the um, long season that we had with uh, good weather in uh, September and October, allowing the crop to mature uh, nicely. And the warm season in July and August actually that pushed the crop development. 
all content of the canola, it's the reflection of the environment. Um, the fact that actually um, the weather was really warm in the south of the prairies compared to the north of the prairies. So Alberta has much higher oil content than Manitoba and Saskatchewan. We also saw that the south of Alberta was much lower in oil content compared to the north of Alberta. Um, location has big effect on oil content this year um, due to the um, environment. The oil content is still within the five years or 10 years average. Um, so when you look at the historic data, uh, really you see that the oil content is really within the average of the last couple of years, um, much lower than what it was uh, last year, but still higher than what we observed in 2018. Protein content of the crop is reflecting the environment uh, growing condition. Uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan higher in protein content compared to Alberta. Um, this is uh, the inverse relationship oil and protein. So Manitoba and Saskatchewan were um, lower in oil content. They have higher uh, protein content and Alberta um, was higher in oil content and therefore lower in protein. At the same time, the south of Alberta was much higher in uh, protein content than the north of Alberta, um, so an effect on the environment. Um, this is within the five years average and well within the 10 years average. Uh, the historic graph of the protein content showed that the um, 2020 uh, protein content is um, higher than the 2019 protein content, but much lower than the 2018 protein content. And if you look um, kind of in the um, average, it will be well within the average um, of the last five to 10 years. The glucosinolate content is not really an issue in Canadian canola. It's been within the 10 micromole per gram um, over the last 10 years. And this year is no different than the previous one. The chlorophyll content um, is um, 8 ppm, 8 milligram per kilogram, um, way lower than the five years or even 10 year average. Um, the range of the uh, chlorophyll content of the sample, it's always um, also lower than what we saw for the last couple of years. Um, it's not unusual to have sampled at 50 uh, ppm, and this year the highest we saw was about 45, which is um, low. So if you see actually the historic data, um, the chlorophyll content is the lowest chlorophyll content that we had in a very long time. Um, this is a reflection on the environment and not so much about the genetics. The alpha linolenic acid of the crop. Um, follow the oil content uh, because the environmental effect on the oil content will be similar on the alpha linolenic acid. So a big difference between the two provinces, um, Alberta being higher in alpha linolenic acid than Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Um, what is quite important to note this year is that actually there is a big range in alpha linolenic acid. Um, we were very surprised when we saw actually um, variety at 5%, 5-6% uh, alpha linolenic acid. And, um, and we were thinking that actually it was high stability canola, that actually no, it was conventional canola. Um, so the, the, the alpha linolenic acid might be an issue this year for some of the exporters um, because the south of Alberta, the south of Saskatchewan, is really low in alpha linolenic acid um, this year. And the average actually is not really a representation of what you will get because there will be a very big difference between um, deliveries. This is the historic data on alpha linolenic acid and the effect on the environment, um, hot and cold. And this year being a warm season, warm growing season, we had um, a low alpha linolenic acid. Uh, since 2000, actually, this is the third lowest alpha linolenic acid content that we saw. 
when you have low alpha-linolenic acid, you will have high oleic acid, and that's what we saw this year. So Manitoba and Saskatchewan higher in oleic acid than um, Alberta. And again, what was very surprising is the range of the oleic acid. We had um, sample with up to 70% uh, oleic acid. And when we look at the name of the variety, those samples were actually um, conventional canola and not high stability canola. This is not the misidentification. Um, so oleic acid, um, oleic acid has been going up for the last couple of years, and um, this year um, oleic acid is much higher than last year, not as high as what we saw in 2018, but still pretty high. The alpha linoleic acid, the oleic acid in the linoleic acid are the one affecting the iodine value. So the difference that you will have in those three fatty acid will be reflected in iodine value of the crop. And that's what we see this year, a big difference between the three provinces. Actually, it's more like a big difference between the south of the prairies compared to the north of the prairies. Um, Alberta being the highest alpha linoleic acid will have the highest um, iodine value. And at the same time, because we have such a big range in um, alpha linoleic acid and oleic acid, there will be a big range in um, iodine value. So that will be different from uh, load to load. Um, this is the historic data for the um, iodine value. Um, low, um, much lower than what we saw last year, not as low that what we saw in 2018, but still um, a low average compared to the other years. Actually, what we see it's these average this year is the reflection of the genetic and the reflection on the environment. And when I say reflection of the genetic is because we have a variety that we find we have um, almost 18% of the sample from um, identify of the sample from that variety. And that variety show a big range in um, oleic acid and alpha linoleic acid. If you look in, um, in Alberta, for example, some of the samples grown in the south of Alberta have 5% um, alpha linoleic acid um, compared to, uh, you know, like the, the only sample that we got from BC, the Peace River, uh, was 11%. Um, half linoleic acid. So a big effect on the environment of the fatty acid composition of that sample, even if that variety has still had uh, saturate that's still uh, way below um, 7%. The quality of the 2020 canola uh, compared to the 2019 canola, um, lower oil content, higher protein content, very similar glucosinolate content, and much lower chlorophyll content for the number one. Um, alpha linoleic acid, um, lower than last year, and oleic acid, um, higher than last year. However, there will be quite a bit of difference from um, load to load due to the uh, effect of the location and the environment. Um, the chlorophyll content actually um, of the number two, number three, and the sample grade much lower than what we see normally um, because of the growing season and the fact that we had the very nice autumn um, helping to develop the crop. And I would like to thank all the people that helped to make this uh, work and um, work in the lab to make sure that everything was done. Thank you very much, and I will take any question you have. Now we will move into the research update session, and I'd like to introduce Delaney Ross Burtnack from the Manitoba Canola Growers Association. Hi, everyone. I'm Delaney Ross Burtnack, Executive Director of the Manitoba Canola Growers, and I'm pleased to join you this week at Canola Week to offer you an update on research in Manitoba. Research is the number one pillar in our five pillar strategic plan, which also includes market development work, advocacy, grower engagement and extension, as well as communications. 
We partner broadly with industry stakeholders on not just short-term projects that offer immediate value to farmers, uh, including tools that they can apply this year or next year, but also medium and longer-term projects that ensure the long-term sustainability and profitability of farmers in Manitoba. Our directors are farmer directors, uh, and they are the ones who decide on what research is being funded. And each year they review our research priorities to ensure that we're uh, still on track in terms of uh, research that meets grower demands. And they've just released their key priorities for 2021. It's very similar to last year. Uh, flea beetles are still number one on the list in terms of concern, uh, as well as sclerotinia control, uh, canola storage practices, fertilizer use efficiency, and varietal differences for a few different criteria, including extreme moisture resilience for both uh, drought and flood uh, resilience, pod shatter resistance, uh, including the um, interest in a consistent rating system for varieties that uh, claim to have pod shatter resistance, and uh, wind tolerance as well. In 2020, uh, MCGA invested nearly $830,000 on research work. Uh, this includes work that uh, was invested in directly as well as through uh, the Canola Council of Canada. Uh, we've also invested in uh, research extension to ensure that this information is communicated out to growers. Our, the total annual value of the 54 research projects that we invested in this past year was over $6 million, and we're very proud to ensure that every dollar that we invest on farmers' behalf is uh, matched by um, outside funding to ensure that those dollars are stretched as far as they can go. So we were very pleased this year to be able to say that uh, for every dollar that we invested, uh, it was matched by $9.5 of additional funding. So there's uh, three topic areas I'd like to share with you today. Uh, one is the Canola Agronomic Research Program, which is uh, jointly funded by uh, Alberta Canola, SAS Canola, as well as ourselves, Manitoba Canola, and uh, is administered by the Canola Council of Canada. So uh, this is a significant program for us and uh, very pleased to be able to uh, partner with these groups to support research uh, that focuses on increasing yield and profitability, reducing production risk and enhancing sustainability for farmers. So in 2020, this past year, um, uh, Alberta Canola, SAS Canola and Manitoba Canola invested over $1.1 million in research projects and very pleased uh, to have new this year matching funding from the Western Grains Research Foundation. So uh, we were able to invest a total of $2.3 million in six projects. Just for your interest, the topics include germ pl uh, plasm discovery, for sclerotinia, sclerotinia tolerance, as you'll recall, that was certainly one of our top uh, concerns. Investigation of natives, native insect pest predators uh, to uh, understand how they may help in terms of um, managing the uh, insect pest population within a crop. Understanding clubroot uh, infection process, improving insect pest monitoring, protein optimization for canola protein, an emerging market uh, for use in uh, human food, and uh, high throughput phenotyping to enable faster screening of um, stable high yielding traits in canola. Uh, and a second initiative I'd like to share with you is Manitoba specific, and uh, it's a very ambitious um, interdisciplinary collaborative initiative. Uh, we partnered with Manitoba Pulse and Soybean Growers, as well as uh, the new Manitoba Crop Alliance, as you uh, may know, uh, a number of uh, groups, including Manitoba Wheat and Barley, Manitoba Corn Growers, uh, all successfully amalgamated this past year to become the Manitoba Crop Alliance. And uh, so this group, one of the goals there is to provide tools to solve current and expected extreme moisture challenges. Um, as you might imagine, this is an extremely complex uh, situation. It costs uh, millions of dollars uh, to growers per year. So uh, very excited to um, bring a very broad uh, number of groups together to uh, figure out how to solve this complex problem. And so there's 10 projects successfully approved and underway. Uh, nine of those started last year and a new one was added this past year. Uh, all of them brought in $1.9 million in funding and uh, are expected to generate more than $19 million in economic impact. 
So just again, for interest, uh, the topics include tile drainage and heavier soils, uh, genetic selection, as well as genetic resilience for uh, moisture uh, resilience, uh, soil moisture monitoring and soil moisture capacity, as well as a couple of cropping systems, ex uh, uh, experiments related to uh, finding the optimum rotation and the impact of cover or relay crops, uh, as well as optimum nutrient um, uh, composition, moving from uh, science to the socioeconomic uh, impacts of managing moisture and uh, water management options in undulating terrain. And finally, the Pest Surveillance Initiative Lab is uh, one that we fund in Manitoba and it supports disease and pesticide resistance management uh, for farmers. And we're very pleased to be able to offer free testing uh, to our members in Manitoba for clubroot, blackleg, verticillium, and glyphosate resistant kochia. And this past year, we uh, were able to offer 150 test codes to date. And uh, just for your interest, uh, about 60% of those were in blackleg, 35% in clubroot, and 5% in kochia. So thank you so much for your time. My contact information is there, and I'll be available for questions during the question period uh, to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much. Next up is myself, Doug Heath, giving a research update for SAS Canola. Good afternoon, everyone. For those that don't know me, I am Doug Heath, the research manager at SAS Canola. And today I'd like to share a little bit about SAS Canola's research program and give an introduction to four newly funded research projects in Saskatchewan. So SAS Canola is supported by 20,000 levy paying Saskatchewan canola producers and we provide value to all canola producers through our four strategic pillars, research and extension of the research results, producer engagement, advocacy for the industry and canola promotion. So SAS Canola works hard to ensure that levy dollars collected from growers are invested in only the best potential research. 40% of our budget is allocated to research projects and over 426 of them have been, have been funded since SAS Canola began. Typically, the research projects that we fund fall under three research themes, which are agronomy, pre-breeding germplasm development, and new uses of oil and meal development for canola utilization. SAS Canola generally funds research through three main research competitions. At the national level, these include both the Canola Agri-Science Cluster and the Canola Agronomy Research Program. At the Saskatchewan level, SAS Canola typically funds research projects through the Saskatchewan Ministry of Agriculture's ADF fund. And SAS Canola is committed to funding four new ADF projects this past year. And I also encourage you to check out the ministry's website for additional canola projects that aren't included in my talk today. So the first project that I'd like to talk about is led by Angela Bedard Hahn from the U of S. So this is the SASC soil information system number three. And this project builds on the two previous iterations of the SKSIS tool. So by integrating soil survey information data with other high resolution soil data sources, the SASC soil information system platform will continue to improve from a one in 100,000 map resolution down to a higher res one in 10,000 scale, which is useful for making field scale decisions. This will be a useful resource for other soil science research and for producers to make better variable rate technology maps for their individual fields. Through user funded models and data sharing incentives, the third version of SASC SIS is being designed to be self-sustainable. The second project is led by Feng Chun Yu from AAFC Saskatoon, and it will develop Brassica nigrate, nigra clubroot resistant traits. With an ever increasing list of new clubroot pathotypes in Canada, it may soon become imperative to have additional sources of clubroot resistance in canola breeding programs. Clubroot resistant varieties are a major tool in managing clubroot, but genetic sources of resistance are limited in Brassica nipa, rapa, and oleracea. Brassica nigra has more genetic variation for clubroot resistance, but, but transferring the Brassica nigra, nigra B genome traits into Brassica napus AC genome is very difficult and time consuming using traditional breeding techniques. 
Recently, a three megabase interval in the Brassica nigro genome with a QTL for club root resistance has been narrowed to one megabase and it contains seven gene candidates. These seven candidates will be isolated and then introduced into Brassica nepus using a, an established gene editing platform that removes any non Brassica selection marker genes. Uh, the third project is led by Fran Wally from the University of Saskatchewan. And this is for rev revising the crop nutrient uptake and removal guidelines. So up till now, the Canadian Fertilizer Institute's nutrient uptake and removal chart is used by many agronomists in Canada, but it now needs to be updated to address large gains in seed yield and nutrients and crop residue in our modern major crop varieties. As well, other tools such as the International Plant Nutrition Institute's Plant Nutrient Removal Calculator are based on crop nutrient values from other countries. So the new project will develop a new new nutrient uptake and removal calculator in a both an online and a mobile app format that will address these gaps and will be based on values measured in Western Canada using modern varieties. And the final project I'd like to talk today about is led by Stephen Shirtliff from the Univers University of Saskatchewan and deals with modulated on-farm response surface experiments or MORSE. Small plot research is often prone to high variability due to field conditions across the plots, but this is still the main type of research design used to develop agronomic recommendations. And this is due to the ability to have a higher possible number of reps for a reasonable cost for the research. At a larger scale, strip trials can provide better average values, but they, they may also be subject to low, lower numbers of reps and higher variability within a field. Morse design trials go beyond these methods and use commercial size equipment at the field scale. With Morse, treatments are adjusted in smaller increments every 10 meters through the full range of treatment values along the field length. And this goes up and down in a sine wave pattern along the length of the field. So as we can see in the top left, uh, 10 meter long treatment adjustments are shown for both wheat on the left and canola on the right in some initial research. So the current project will evaluate incremental changes like this in fungicide rates and nitrogen rates. And by using advanced multispectral imaging and automated phenotyping, along with response surface statistical analysis, uh, these will determine the optimal rates for both treatments. So this type of experimental, experimental design could lead to better accuracy and reduced variability compared to small plot research and the res results using commercial equipment at field scale may translate more easily to farming operations. So these Morse experiments will be compared to small plot RCBD experiments that are run at the same time. I think, thank you for your attention. Ward Toma will give us the research perspective from Alberta Canola. Good day, everyone. My name is Ward Toma, I'm the general manager with Alberta Canola. I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to come and talk about one of our co-funded cooperative projects that we're involved with. Uh, it's for the Canola Agronomic Research Program. Uh, specifically, uh, surveillance networks are beneficial in insects part two, expanding surveillance of reservoir habitats and measuring their contributions to canola yield. This is funded by uh, Alberta Canola and uh, jointly with the Manitoba Canola Growers Association. Now, this is part two. Part one was a CARP project undertaken by Dr. Galpern uh, from the University of Calgary that investigated the contribution of natural or non-cropped land to being a reserve for beneficial insects and determining if this contributes to yield. Part one was successful in, in that a method to predict services provided by beneficial insects was developed. The research team for part two is comprised of uh, the, basically the same group of Dr. Alpern's research group at the University of Calgary, with the addition of Laurel Thompson, the crop research scientist at Lakeland College in Vermilion, Alberta. And Laurel has brought to the group a couple of large, a couple of cooperative cooperators of farmers that brought a lot of large amount of precision ag data to this to the research program. The study part two seeks to expand the work on part one, of course, by ground truthing the estimation methods that they developed to, this, to increase survey data. To, as well as increasing the surveillance area of insects and incorporating the precision ag data. 
uh, to help uh, help field truth the estimation. And the work is going to be expanded to to incorporate a network across Manitoba and Saskatchewan and determine the availability of beneficial insects in various natural habitats as they are across the western prairies. And the goal is to provide, able to provide in the end, regionally appropriate advice to canola producers about how to manage these, uh, these natural habitats uh, in order to promote uh, more beneficial insects. And why would, why would canola farmers be interested in this? Well, they're all, they've always had a strong interest in beneficial insects and the work that they can do on the farm because the more that the beneficial insects thrive and operate, the less the non-beneficial insects have an impact. So the kernel growers in Alberta and Manitoba Research Committee quite quickly saw that this work could provide farmers with more information about non-cropped areas in their farms. And, and that information would uh, help them make better land use decisions in the future. I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for this opportunity to come and talk about this project. Uh, if you want to look or learn more about this project and more of the ones that we have on the go and some of the ones that we've talked about and that we've dealt with in the past, Please go to our website, albertacanola.com forward slash projects uh, to see some of it's there. A lot of our projects, because they're done collaboratively with the Canola Council of Canada and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada through the canola, various canola clusters over time, uh, they can be found at the uh, Canola Research Hub. As well, uh, I, would, I would urge folks to go look at canadianagronomist.ca. It's a very good uh, resource. Uh, they do a good job of taking published research projects and the reports, translating it into useful information for extension agents and farmers to be able to apply locally on their farm. Again, thank you. To give us an update on the canola cluster projects is Curtis Rempel from the Canola Council of Canada. Hello, I'm Curtis Rempel, the Vice President for Crop Production and Innovation at the Canola Council of Canada. I am pleased to provide an update on the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Canola AgriScience Cluster. The Canadian Agricultural Partnership is a five-year, $3 billion investment by federal, provincial, and territorial governments to strengthen the agriculture and agri-food sector. The Canola Value Chain is a participant in the Canadian Ag Partnership, or CAP, through the Canola AgriScience Cluster. Federal funding to the canola agri-science clusters provided through Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada and the canola industry is fun funding is provided by the members of the Canola Council of Canada as a core funding activity with additional dollars provided by the three provincial canola producers commissions, Manitoba Canola Growers Association, SAS Canola and Alberta Canola. The Canola Agri-Science Cluster is administered by the Canola Council of Canada in partnership with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Research activities are conducted by Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada scientists, university scientists, provincial special specialists, and industry scientists. The Canola Council of Canada also plays a key role, together with the partners mentioned above, in knowledge and technology transfer ensuring that the results of all of this excellent research are available to canola producers and commercial agronomists to increase canola yields, profitability, sustainability, and reduce sector risk. The Canola AgriScience Cluster has seven themes. These are differentiated quality and enhanced environmental performance in food processing, differentiated quality and sustainable livestock production using canola meal, increased production, yield and quality optimization for sustainable supply, sustainability and climate change, improving canola nutrient and water use efficiency, sustainability and climate change through integrated pest management. This includes a significant amount of research on flea, beetle, flea beetles and club root management, putting innovation into action, the knowledge and technology transfer research hub, and maintaining canola supply and trade by managing black leg and verticillium. There are 35 research activities in these themes and more details on the research activities can be found at the Can Canola Council of Canada website. The canola cluster research in 2020 has been impacted by the COVID pandemic. 
research facilities at the government, university, and private sector were shut down in mid to late March to slow the spread of COVID-19. We immediately began discussions with the principal investigators or PIs at AFC and the universities as to how we could best support research activities so that we could move these activities forward while ensuring everyone's safety. This resulted in writing numerous letters of support for PIs and projects. At AAFC in March 2020, all non-core activities moved off station. Core activities which kept, which kept functioning included care and maintenance of animals, genetic material, biocontainment, and specialized lab equipment. In April 2020, some time-sensitive services resumed. This included distribution of breeder seed, land and infrastructure maintenance, and some of the field studies, especially those pertaining to winter crops. May saw further resumption of field work with special focus on rotation trials, but many of the can canola agri-science cluster project trials were planted along with the canola variety registration trials. Universities followed a similar trajectory for field activities, but were able to resume lab-related activities following very stringent safety protocols. This was in part done to accommodate graduate students that were nearing completion of MSc or doctoral programs. August saw a graduated opening of research, AAFC research facilities, greenhouses, and further resumption of animal trials. The AAFC research centers opened at staggered intervals beginning in mid-August with a final opening in mid-October. Opening dates varied depending upon the local COVID situations. Capacity and opening procedures were unique and continued to be uh, unique to each, each of the research facilities. And the plan is to further integrate activity, but this could change again as the COVID situation changes. Paramount is the safety and well being of all of the research staff and personnel. During all of this time, the Canola Council of Canada has, continu has had continuous formal and informal meetings and discussions with AAFC scientists, technology officers, station directors, and science cluster administrators, as well as university faculty and administration. We were asked to assign priority to CAP research projects and activities and review suggested changes to budgets and work plans. Two formal surveys were conducted with the principal investigators to determine potential impact to project activities and budgets given delays due to COVID, in addition to many informal discussions and virtual meetings. We have calls with CAP science cluster administrators and directors one to two times per month to update and plan. Additionally, all of the science clusters meet monthly to share strategies and update each other on activities. A key outcome of these calls in conjunction with AAFC was a proposal to Treasury Board to carry forward project funds that could not be spent in 2020 to 2021 and 2022. This is a unique request. AAFC and industry did not want to lose these valuable research dollars. This request has been approved by the Treasury Board, and we have flexibility to carry our industry funding forward our industry funding contributions as well. The researchers have been given opportunity to defer AAFC funds and rework their budgets to align with altered and reduced work plans due to the pandemic. 11 researchers requested a revision to their budgets due to the impact that COVID has had on the research year. A brief update with, for the Canola Agronomy Research Program, or CARP. This research is funded entirely by the canola producers in each of the Prairie Provinces, the Manitoba Canola Growers, SAS Canola, and Alberta Canola. And the program is administered by the Canola Council of Canada. 44 letters of intent were submitted this fall and 21 full proposals have been requested. Full proposals have been reviewed by Canola Council of of Canada agronomy specialist and industry experts and feedback has been provided for the grower research committees to use as a resource when discussing full proposals in their prospective meetings. Determination of, of grower joint funding and approval of full proposals will, will conclude in January 2021. Currently there are 21, uh, 27 projects that are active 
And some of these active projects have had challenges with COVID and there has, and the CCC has worked with PIs to make appropriate adjustments, timelines and finances. Moving forward, we are gonna be continue to touch base with all of the PIs that are involved in CAP and CARP early in the new year. With respect to the future Canola AgriScience or, or Canada AgriScience partnerships, especially pertaining to canola. We had a meeting in February of 2022 with all of the uh, canola cluster representatives attending in Ottawa to begin planning for the next cluster. Conversations were focused on cluster uh, management best practices and administration. And there was further investigation of cross-sector collaboration between clusters. We also shared success stories which were helpful to see where challenges lie and where the where successes originate and where the program can be uh, improved. Bringing scientists and regional man managers together was an experiment and is perhaps a model going forward. And this is very much on the minds of A on Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And so we begin um, as part of the this Canola Industry Week to start identifying our strategic priorities for the next agri-science partnership. And we'll continue to consult and then bring these, these uh, priorities forward to Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada for consideration. With the goal of promoting continued private and public partnerships with emphasis on changing climate. Thank you. Our final speaker in the research update session will be Pat Flayton from WGRF. I was asked to use a, a few minutes to talk about how the Western Grains Research Foundation is funding crop research and in particular canola research. You may already know WGRF, it's an organization that's going to celebrate its 40th anniversary next year, so it's been around for a while. Uh, WGRF is entirely focused on funding crop research and in its earlier years, uh, due to the wheat and barley checkoffs, its main focus was cereal research. However, uh, currently it's funding research related to many crops, including canola, of course, because it's such a, a major crop in Western Canada. Our funding priorities fall into two spaces, genetic solutions that ultimately make their way into variety development and production, or in other words, agronomic solutions. You may know that many other producer funders are also in, interested in a third area, the value added or post-harvest area of research, but that's not been where uh, WGRF has, has seen priorities. Our mission is really simple. We exist to direct funds towards crop research and crop research that's meant to benefit Western Canadian farmers. Just that simple. Um, we are organized as a registered charity and follow those rules. Our decision makers are 18 farmers from every corner of the crop belt across Western Canada. And currently we have about $14 million uh, going out the door every year for research, uh, which amounts to about uh, currently about 170 or so research projects uh, that are in our files uh, on the go. And uh, those are related to 15 crops. We fund research associated with both single crops and multi-crops. And uh, we're also uh, very much involved uh, currently in funding uh, capacity improvements in um, research institutions across Western Canada. And I'll talk to, uh, to that a little bit more in detail. Um, how is canola research then funded by WGRF? Canola, uh, the Canola Council coordinates um, a CARP program, the Canola Agronomic Research Program, and that's funded by the Provincial Canola Commissions. And we've been involved in that now for a couple of rounds, a couple of years. Um, and then we're also involved in the provincial processes, um, Ag Action Manitoba, Saskatchewan's ADF program, and the Alberta 
Agriculture Funding Consortium. And uh, in all those cases, those provincial processes are open for um, funding uh, by other industry organizations. Uh, we're also involved in several research clusters, uh, which are supported, of course, by Ag Canada and other industry partners. Uh, we are leading one of those clusters, the Integrated Crop Agronomy Cluster. And that cluster is meant to focus on research associated with multi-crop agronomy. Um, and uh, we're also involved in a very major research capacity initiative. Um, in that research capacity initiative, we've got two phases. The first phase, uh, which we've been working on for, for a few years now, um, and is, it has come to fruition um, this year. Uh, we have uh, a focus in this phase on human resources. So we have Dr. Marissa Borgo, who arrived in early March um, to the University of Saskatchewan as the Integrated Agronomy Chair. We have Dr. Linda Gorham, who's arrived at the University of Alberta as the Research Chair in Cropping Systems. And we have Dr. Mario Tenuta, who has uh, been successful in getting not only industry support, but NSERC support as the industrial research chair for 4R nutrient management at the University of Manitoba. The second phase of this capacity initiative has been more recent in development. Uh, we had a one-time special call for proposals in early 2020 and uh, the board has now made its commitments of about $24 million to expand capacity um, in infrastructure in Western Canada. And that mostly means uh, field and lab equipment, uh, actual buildings and, and lab development are, are starting to roll out. And this will continue over the next couple of years, two or three or four years probably, as institutions gather their own other resources and finalize their plans. So in summary, WGRF uh, is, is about farmers funding research. There are several avenues to access WGRF funding for crop specific research and integrated multi-crop research. And we have a capacity initiative that we, we expect there'll be impacts seen over many years to come. So thank you very much for participating in Canola Week this year. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Pat, and good afternoon. So my name is Mark Smith. I'm with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Saskatoon, and I will host the last three talks of our session today. These talks are going to focus on challenges and opportunities for canola. And first up, we have Larissa Moria with Farmers Business Network. Good morning, fellow Canola Week participants. It's my pleasure to speak to you today about Farmers Business Network and the opportunities we're building in Canada. Because FBN is fairly new to the Canadian market, before diving into the research and development efforts, I would like to take a few minutes to talk about FBN's business. FBN's global headquarters is located in San Carlos, California, just outside of San Francisco. The company was established in 2014 to increase choice and transparency through peer community communication, all with the goal to maximize farmers' profit and return on investment. The mission of the company is to always put farmers first by democratizing information provide unbiased and independent farmer-driven analytics. FBN started their Canadian division in 2017 with the head office in High River, Alberta. And this year they entered the Australian market and their head office is located in South Perth, Western Australia.
FBN has built a group of 13,000 members covering 40 million acres of farmland across the US, Canada, and Australia. This year, FBN Canada welcomed members in BC and Ontario with over 2,500 members in total. And you can see farmers are joining the network and growing the business quickly. Why are farmers joining? FBN offers crop production products for oil seeds, pulses, cereals, and horticulturals, inoculants, surfactants, adjuvants, nutritionals, and biologicals. And in the seed genetics area, corn, soybeans, sorghum, alfalfa, and now canola. All of these inputs can be ordered online and shipped directly to the farmer's yard. In addition, FBN offers price transparency through the FBN community and data analytics to help farmers understand performance and make informed buying decisions. This year, we launched the Community Builders Program. This program is a network of local individuals, so neighbors, who act as small third-party territory representatives that can assist farmers with their transactions, providing advice and guidance in their purchasing decisions. And in September, the cost to sign up as a new member was removed, so joining the FBN network is now free. Now that you know a little bit about the business, let's discuss the R&D efforts FBN is investing in. FBN breeding programs are built on the company's principle of farmers first and is focused on developing hybrids that give farmers the best return on investment. In 2018, FBN launched the F2F Genetics Network and acquired, acquired the corn breeding program that has 20 years of experience developing elite genetics for the U.S. Central Corn Belt. And FBN is making substantial increased investments to expand the corn program to provide great genetics for the Northern Plains and into Canada. In October, FBN was excited to announce that they had entered the canola breeding business. This step included the addition of Haplotech based in Winnipeg. The Haplotech team has technical expertise in canola double haploid development, trait integration, pre-breeding strategies, and research field testing. In addition, FBN acquired canola germplasm from Cebus Canada and a license to access their pod shatter reduction trait. As you can see, FBN is committed to providing elite genetics and supporting Canadian agriculture. The concept of network is very much a part of who we are. We have developed a network of independent plant breeders, already 15 members in the corn breeding business, who collaborate to develop superior genetics and identify the best hybrid combinations. We support the independent plant breeders with elite germplasm for breeding, the latest breeding technologies, and a large channel to market. We plan to take this same approach in our canola breeding and invite collaboration with other breeders. FBN Canada's canola breeding team will include 15 full-time staff with laboratory and field capabilities in Winnipeg and the surrounding area. The objective of the canola breeding effort is to deliver high quality canola varieties to North American, primarily in Canada, and Australian farming communities. We are committed to exploring all options to deliver competitive products that will positively contribute to the farmer's bottom line. Price option is an important goal for the canola breeding program. We are open and interested in collaborating with both private and public canola breeders to bring a variety of options to farmers. New technologies in plant breeding, including genomics, phenomics, data science, gene editing, and the like, paired with traditional breeding applications, put all breeding programs in a position for rapid evolution. 
We believe using these new techniques in our program will enable us to unlock the diversity in our germplasm and more rapidly advance commercially relevant germplasm and reduce the time to market. FBN is a leading analytics company in the agricultural sector. Data wrangling and data analytics, including exploration and modeling, are the backbone of the FBN business structure. So likewise, it will be the backbone in the breeding program. Data science is FBN's strength, and we anticipate utilizing this expertise to rapidly advance germplasm by integrating on-farm results with R&D trials to identify the best fit between genetics, environment, and production practices. Molecular biology and bioinformatics tools available within FBN will assist with and help direct the breeding crossing decisions and predict advancement decisions. We believe the unique and wide germplasm acquired from CBIS access to CBIS trait pipeline, the technical expertise and turnkey infrastructure acquired from Haplotech, our interest to partner with the larger plant breeding community, and FBN's strength in data science and analytics provides a unique opportunity to enhance canola breeding and provide new and varied options to canola growers. I thank you for your time today and look forward to answering any questions you may have during the Q&A session. Enjoy the rest of the Canola Week presentations as I know I will, and I wish you the best of health. Thank you, Larissa. So our next speaker is Frederick Bissonnette with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency. Hello, my name is Frédéric Bissonnet. I'm currently the Chief Registrar and Director General of the Registration Directorate. I worked previously as the Acting DG uh, for the Revolution Program. I'd like to thank Dr. Rampol and the Canal Council for inviting me to present to you with updated information on PMRA today. Uh, so some of the information I'll be sharing with you is the impact of COVID-19 measures on our business. Uh, I was asked also to give you a brief history and an update on our neonicotinoid post-market reviews, uh, some information on our post-market work plan for 2020-2025, an update on our program renewal initiative, and finally, uh, some information on the use of vegetative filter strips as a risk mitigation measure. So as all organizations in Canada across the world, the pandemic had a significant impact on PRA business. First, uh, since we have a lot of uh, scientists trained in public health, we were asked to assist other part of the government in our uh, effort uh, on dealing with a pandemic. For example, some of our scientists were asked to assist our sister branch uh, with the registration of disinfectant sanitizers also to help public health officials with contact tracing and whatnot. So uh, this has ramped down a bit lately, but we're still assisting uh, where we can. And I don't expect this uh, to, uh, to go away until at least the pandemic is resolved. Another aspect that affected us is, as you probably know, before we make any kind of major decision, uh, we're required by a law to publish consultation document and final decision. And because there are so many documents being published uh, uh, by the government on the pandemic, all of those resources are devoted to that effort. Uh, it start, uh, things have started to pick up again in June, but we are having, we have a backlog uh, that we haven't completely eliminated yet. And there's the, the publication resources sporadically being asked to assist on the COVID effort still. Uh, so it's not a, a business as usual and won't be probably for a little while. Also, initially, when the pandemic started, uh, there wasn't not enough uh, connection to the network. So uh, PMR staff not being actively involved, uh, with a few exception on the, uh, the COVID critical work, we were asked to take a back seat and we'll need access early in the morning and late that night. So that did create some uh, other backlogs uh, in, in our, our uh, work that doesn't require consultation, for example. 
uh, things are mostly normal now, but we're not 100% and like everybody will learn to work remotely. So about his Neonix and our history of our reviews. So this all started uh, due to growing international attention on the potential risks the Neonix were presenting to uh, pollinators. So as a result, uh, PMRA has initiated uh, uh, pollinator focus reevaluation to try to tackle the issue. Uh, Imidacloprid was already on the way, so uh, that was uh, part of the effort. Uh, and while we were doing that review, the pollinator one, uh, we came across information that suggested neonics uh, were found at uh, harmful levels in the aquatic environment. And uh, by law, PMR is required to uh, initiate special review if uh, we have reasonable doubt to believe that uh, risk might be unacceptable for human health of the environment. Uh, so based on the information we had at the time, which mostly consisted of modeling and some information from out east, uh, we had to propose a cancellation of the measure of outdoor use of the three neonics in order to protect the environment. Uh, understandably, uh, this created some angst among stakeholders, and it led to several initiatives on water monitoring, especially uh, to try to gather the information that we were, re were required to uh, make an informed decision. So that led, in, among other things, to the creation of the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Water Monitoring Working Group, which has collected a huge amount of information uh, on water monitoring. So not only that, but provinces also ramped up, some registrant provided some of the information and not a day goes by with new scientific paper being published on neonics. So it created a huge amount of information for us to go through. So as I alluded before, there's many components to the uh, new, new and continuing review. It's not as uh, typical to have it split that way, but it is what it is. So there's a pollinator assessment, which was actually concluded and then final decision published in 2019. Uh, the decision was to cancel many of the use on crop that bees find attractive, like orchard, for example, and also prohibiting sp uh, sprays while the bees are foraging, so before or during bloom. Seed treatment were found to be acceptable, but in order to deal some incidents that were found in corn and soybean growing areas, uh, we required the use of, uh, of a special lubricant that reduced the dust that was emitted during planting that caused harm to bees. As a result of that measure, the incident dropped significantly by more than 80%. The other activity is the Aquatic Invertebrate Special Review for Clothianidin Parmatoxin. I just spoke about that. Uh, there's the ongoing imidacloprid cyclical revaluation that includes the rest except the pollinator. We also have the rest of thymethoxin and clothinidin, so the non-pollinator, not aquatic uh, assessment that's on the way. Uh, for example, birds and mammals, the human health aspect. Uh, so this one is on its way. It's, it's in early days for now. Uh, and finally, we do have a special review on squash bees because some information was provided to us that uh, suggests that squash bees were particularly sensitive to neonics. So this one is another activity that's ongoing. Uh, we publish in September an update on our, uh, all of our work on Neonix. Uh, initially, we were hoping to get a decision out early year in, in the year uh, because of COVID and the amount of information that we're facing. Uh, we're now targeting spring 2021. Uh, we don't have a specific month yet because there's still a pandemic and uh, we're not quite sure what's going to happen, but we do hope that at the latest, a decision will be reached and published by spring 2021. Uh, the other activities will continue past spring 2021. So the other aspects of clothin, anthamethoxin, and squash. I was asked to comment on the water monitoring information. So in, in normal time, like the PMA uses exposure models to estimate concentration of pesticide in both surface and groundwater. Those are the same model pre and post market. So what allows a pesticide to go to the market? It's the same information or model that we use on the post market side. So when a risk is identified, water monitoring data can really help to refine and reduce conservatism. Uh, the models are conservative by nature because uh, since we don't have the pulse of what's out there, we want to be sure that uh, whatever we release and uh, allow to be released in the environment won't harm the environment, hence they conserve nature. Uh, so when we do have information, 
in certain areas. It can be used in that area, but obviously it's better to get cross-country inform information. And uh, this is kind of what happened with the water monitoring working group. So the group has facilitated coordination of water monitoring across the nation. We have very good data from pretty much all the agricultural important region of Canada. Uh, the scientists have told me that it's very robust water monitoring information and uh, will allow us to like further refine the risk assessment. And so the decision, whatever it is, will be very highly reflective of what's really out there, not just conservative models. Uh, with regard to pesticide revaluation work plan, uh, we started publishing those in 2015. Uh, the idea is to both inform on what or when we intend to consult or, or publish a final decision on the ongoing uh, reviews, but also to highlight what's uh, going to be initiated in the next five years. Uh, by law, we have to initiate revaluation every 15, 15 years, so we're able to predict uh, what will come next. And this we hope helps stakeholders prioritize resources. Like if there's a very important active that's coming up, uh, most stakeholders are aware of the kind of information need that we have, the registrant knows the, the, the data requirements. So hopefully it helps them prepare for when the actual initiation is started, uh, revaluation is started, and we have the information when we need it. Uh, usually we publish it every spring, but uh, this year again, because of COVID was delayed to September, but we do plan to resume uh, publishing in the, in the spring moving forward. And uh, the next one will supposed to be in March of 2021. So you may have heard of this from other uh, PMRA folks. Uh, they did a tour of uh, multiple stakeholders to inform a, a, of the issue of our post-market workload. So after an analysis, uh, PMR identified an issue where the work, the upcoming workload with all the initiation will far exceed our capacity to deliver. Right now we're delivering about 16 decisions a year on the post-market side, and we're supposed to initiate 30 or more revaluation per year. So there's no way we can match the output that's needed to at least stay, break even. Uh, so for that result, uh, for that reason, we're looking at the new approach, uh, which we refer to as a program renewal to create a more sustainable program. Uh, but while the programs are the way it's not gonna happen overnight, uh, we have to tackle the current workload. So we decided to take a risk-based approach and prioritize the revaluation. So the first course cut was uh, made last year where we decided to focus our energies on old pesticide, which should be between 19, uh, before 1995 and we're making excellent progress there. Also uh, uh, some older cyclicals and also making great progress there. The new NICs we just talked about, and also some old special reviews. And because the program renewal is not gonna happen overnight and the uh, initiation will continue, we came up with a risk-based triage system and prioritization process for the, uh, the, the upcoming workload. So at least we're focused on energy where it's uh, more worth it uh, in terms of risk uh, and protecting Canadians and the environment. So talking about integrated approach, uh, so some of the work's been delayed because of COVID, but we are making progress. Uh, we have identified pilots we want to run. Uh, we have completed some of the stakeholder, early stakeholder engagement. We have prioritized some components we want to work on, and we're also developing models uh, and checking against our current legal framework to see if we can uh, do them. Uh, with the current PCPA, Pest Control Products Act. Uh, and so far, we do believe that pretty much everything we're, in, we're entertaining, we will be able to do under the current legal framework. Uh, we are also working on our staff, so make sure that they'll be ready for the change and, uh, and we'll continue engaging with stakeholders, stakeholders as the program progresses. Finally, last topic, vegetative bulk filter strips. What are they? So it's a way to reduce runoff into surface water. Uh, you may hear a different terminology. I think some of them vegetative buffer strip is sometimes used, but uh, we decided to use the vegetative filter strips. Uh, so we defined them as a permanently vegetative strip of land between the downslope of a edge of a field and the surface of a water body. It must be composed of grass uh, uh, mostly and must be maintained. Uh, the reason for maintenance is if the grass grows too long uh, and there's a significant rain event, it can bend the the, uh, the grass and lead to channeling where it, great, it 
it allows greater access of the uh, downflow water to the water body. So that's why there's a requirement to maintain the, veg the vegetative filter strip. So they work by slowing down the runoff, allowing it to deposit uh, the suspended, so, uh, uh, suspended molecule in the soil. Uh, also by infiltration, so it penetrates in the soil and is retained within the strip. And finally, through plant update, uptake, uh, where the pesticide is drawn into the plant and uh, doesn't reach the water. Uh, so we currently require uh, VFS when it's for persistent and IV sorptive pesticides or pesticide that will bind uh, to soil, for example, when there's a risk identified. And also when we believe that uh, a VFS will actually uh, help effectively mitigate the risk. Right now, they're a, a 10 meter wide strip of land. Uh, the reason being that the information that we have to show that it's effective was based on 10 meters. Uh, so unless we get information that shows a lesser amount is equally effective, the, the, the strip will remain at 10. Uh, and uh, some information can be found in permethrin where some of uh, the revaluation decision for permethrin with some of that uh, explanation is provided. So, so far we've implemented for some pesticides uh, and some proposed ones, but we do see the requirement expand and it's a way to keep pesticides on the market by uh, managing the risk uh, through this mean. We did produce a few fact sheets, uh, which I believe are available publicly. Uh, these are to help explain stakeholders and inspectors, for example, from a pesticide program and, and what these vegetative filter strips are all about and how they're supposed to be uh, uh, created and maintained. We we'll also have a small section on our website that gives a bit of information on the vegetative filter strip. So as next steps is to continue to confirm uh, the effectiveness of VFS and look for how effective they could be in the context of solvable pesticide. So more work will be happening in that area and you can expect to hear more from, from PMRA on that. So that concludes my presentation. I hope you found it useful. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. And just a reminder to everybody that our speakers are available for questions at the end of this session. So our last speaker for today is David Diziak with Botanico in Calgary. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm David Diziak with Botanico and it's great to be able to join you here this afternoon, even though it is virtually, certainly would be great to be together in person. I've always uh, enjoyed what goes on at this uh, meeting here. So I've got the opportunity to uh, share my views on the thoughts of uh, where I see canola and, and a view to the future. So I had a great long career at Dow AgroSciences and at Corteva, uh, being involved in their canola business there. And then uh, now at Panico, you know, we're taking a look at different ways to uh, process canola um, taking the seed apart, pulling out new things like oligosomes and making proteins for food and for aquaculture. And that's given me new and uh, deeper insights into the downstream markets and, and what's driving those. And so using those two pieces of my history and experience, I'd uh, like to share uh, what I think the industry needs and where it's going and where I see the opportunity space for our crop going forward. So to uh, know where you're going, it's always useful to have a sense of where you've been. And uh, canola is a crop that's got an amazing history. And to me, it's really been driven by three big periods. The first one back into the 80s was really when canola really came into its own and really driven by uh, being a low saturate oil that had a great fit for the food industry. You know, Procter & Gamble was selling Puritan oil. They needed a low saturate oil and canola really fit the bill. And that really helped to get established in with the US food industry. You know, productivity continued to improve. Um, you know, we continued to market the crop. And then in through around 1995, biotech traits came in and that really helped drive our productive capacity. And then you know, around 2000, hybrid, hybrid canola really began to take hold and we began to realize the benefits of that. And then you know, around 2005, we really had that settle in and it really began to see the opportunity around yield and productivity that hybrids and GMO traits could bring uh, to the uh, crop. And after 2005, 
was really another and different period again. Uh, we had new trades like high oleic oils, which really drove uh, net new demand for the industry, really introduced it, the oil into whole uh, different parts of the U.S. food industry and biofuels at the same time. And so the global demand for renewable fuels and combined with the productivity of canola really helped canola get uh, into a much greater supply and that helped drive demand for it. And uh, that really helped the crop take off to the productive level that it's at today. So what do we see going next? Well, looking to the future, I really think um, it'll be driven by protein. Uh, if you look what's happening around the food industry, around the feed industry, and around where the opportunity for the crop is, I really think it's uh, an important part of the crop that we've never really paid much attention to that really begs um, with opportunity and really can be an important part of taking the crop into the next level. Um, it, there's that old saying that demographics are destiny. Uh, I really believe that is the case. If you take a look at where consumers are going, uh, not just in North America, but all across the first world, and they're really settling into a plant-based diet that's very common you know, across Asia Pacific. Um, you know, the popularity is growing. It's now a $5 billion industry in the U.S., just uh, doubled in the course of the last three years. You've got 24% of consumers eating more plant-based dairy products. Conventional dairy fell in its consumption by 2% the other year. Plant-based dairy grew by something like 17% in its category growth. Um, <clears throat> a lot of it's still driven by health. People are paying more and more attention to what they choose and choosing health above all. And even if the consumer, if the ingredient panel is the same, consumers believe that plant-based foods are healthier, even when the, and the panel is equal. And sustainability is a really important part, and I'll touch upon that later. But there's a much greater expectation and a requirement that we are producing foods in an environmentally sustainable way, uh, hopefully in ways that can and even help address climate change, and that would be very important. And at the bottom of it is really driven by uh, probably the most impactful change, which is around a whole new generation of, of people that are coming into, into the consumer space. So Generation Z and young millennials, they will form the biggest shopping cohort, consumer cohort ever, much bigger than the baby, boom, baby boomers. And this group eats differently. So we've got a generational change in diet pattern and that generational change in diet pattern is a forever change and something we need to be very mindful of and make sure we can fit in with. If we take a look at the food industry, and people may have seen some of this data before, but the uh, plant proteins going into food is really dominated by soy and by wheat. But the industry needs new and different proteins, things that bring in different flavors, different tastes, bring in different functionalities, there is a strong need to get soy off the label in many applications. Soy is one of the big eight uh, food allergens, as is wheat. So bringing in things that can fit and replace those products is going to be very important. This is over $5 billion industry today, are growing at double-digit CAGR. And we've seen growth in P, but there is a wide open space in here for canola to fit in. You know, one of the main reasons is that it really has a, the potential for a, a terrific nutrition profile. And so it can be every bit as good as, uh, as soy. It can provide a complete protein. And that's very unique of all the other plant proteins. So pea can't do it. Hemp can't do it. Certainly wheat can't do it. But the core nutrition profile of soy, of canola, I mean, is very, very good. And we really need to take advantage of that. Looking at the global feed market. You know, from 2020 to 2027, there'd be much more than a doubling of global feed demand. And so we, as we continue to have people moving into the middle class, they want to eat better, something like 70% of each new dollar of income goes towards better food. And this is a very important industry for canola today. But we're really playing in the into the lower value end of this spectrum. And so the opportunity for us to get into higher value monogastric feeds, to get into aquaculture feeds, to get into companion animal feeds is a great opportunity for the crop and we need to be able to somehow find a way to really take advantage of that. One of the areas certainly is around aquaculture. And so pretty soon we're gonna be farming more fish than we do from the wild catch. The fish is an important part of the global protein and in many, many diets around the world, it's preferred. 
on the chart on the right, you can see that red dotted line. Uh, that's demand for aquaculture production up to 2050. And so there's a huge need in here. But of course, um, you know, we used to feed fish fish meal, but the supply of fish meal is static to declining. And so feed companies in this industry are looking towards plant proteins and other proteins as new sources of plant uh, of, of, of protein ingredient. Uh, canola can fit in here very, very well. This is a great opportunity space, one that we are focused on. And, um, and it's something that can be a great value driver for, uh, for canola. So if we take a look, you know, when you concentrate protein, you certainly increase uh, the value. And canola today, you know, is around $300 a ton, but being able to move it up into protein concentrates where they can be worth upwards of $2,000 a ton, moving it into protein isolates where it can be upwards of eight to $10,000 a ton, uh, we can fit into these markets. We just need to um, make a better protein than what we're making today. And that can get done either through plant breeding uh, and through processing or really a combination of both. And so this is where we need to be able to look. And this is really where I think the big uh, future is for our uh, crop. 30% you know, of what's in canola seed today really has no to, to very limited value. You know, we're 45% oil. Uh, that's got a lot of value. We're about 20% protein. Um, you have to commend people like uh, Corteva. They're taking a look at really driving, high, uh, creating high protein canola. There's a lot more we can do within the crop. There are things uh, within um, this 30% today that uh, contribute to um, you know, the anti-nutritional aspects, that contribute to uh, poor flavor. And these are things that we can knock out. Um, we've got this great toolbox coming that we can really put to use to help help realize that. Sustainability is gonna be a very important story for Canela looking into the future. We need to keep digging in and really help to develop this even more than what we have so far. Um, you know, we've got a great base of, of attributes. You know, we're growing under rain-fed production. We've increased our production with no expansion in acres. Uh, we're growing in a sustainable crop rotation, you know, with pulse crops and legumes and cereals. That's a great part of the story. But maybe most importantly is that, uh, you know, our prairie agricultural system today is really approaching net zero for greenhouse gas emissions. And so, you know, for the carbon we burn to grow the crop, um, we put that much back into the soil. And we need to develop this story further uh, and even better. And uh, this can be an important uh, part of what we need to tell into the future. I know that many companies in the food area and in the aquaculture feed area, uh, this is gonna be a critical set of table stakes. And so this sustainable intensification that we've looked at with the crop needs to be um, better told, further told, uh, further verified, as it will be very, very important. Um, we've got this great new toolbox that's available to us uh, now. You know, in the past, we, we really relied upon using you know, biotech and transgenic tools. They certainly, it's a great part of our toolbox, but it's expensive. And the regulatory path is long. And getting approvals in some of these foreign destinations and markets is uh, really cumbersome, it's unpredictable, which makes it unattractive to try and invest in. But if we can come up with a good um, rational regulatory system uh, where if we're doing things like really just uh, doing changes within the genome, either down-regulating uh, elements, or telling the, the seed to stop making something, you know, make less of this, make more of that, uh, if we can uh, regulate that properly, it can open up a world of opportunity for our crop. Um, in a lot of ways, canola has got a lot of things in it that we've never really paid much attention to. Um, and if we can get rid of these, some of these anti-flavor components, some of these anti-nutritional components, uh, it can be um, great in helping to reposition canola. You have to remember too, that a large part of the world still thinks that canola is rapeseed. And uh, rapeseed's got you know, a lot of baggage attached to it from what that used to be. And so we need to do a much better job of telling the new story around the crop and showing that we've made good changes in crop composition to overcome some of these uh, historical hurdles. Protein Industries Canada, I think can be a really important tool in helping to uh, build up our ecosystem and tell our story and help drive the innovation. You know, our system in agriculture here in the prairies is pretty traditional. We've really been built around 
you know, growing bigger crops, putting them into bigger grain elevators, loading them into bigger trains and getting it to port and putting it into a bigger ship. We need to do much more of this value added processing here at home. Uh, there's huge uh, economic gains to be made with that. And so, um, you know, looking at PIC, you know, there really is four main pillars around helping to create a better quality, higher protein seeds, being able to grow higher quality crops, using all the data and knowledge that we've got out there, putting it into systems that we can mine better to help our producers do a better job and help transfer quality attributes uh, further down the, down the value chain. Uh, make, it's really around novel processing. There's a lot of uh, good technologies out there around how to separate, isolate, purify proteins and related co-products. And so bringing in a second generation processing industry, really building a new adjacent space to the current industry is a huge opportunity uh, for uh, Canadian canola. And then selling, you know, getting out of our non-traditional markets, learning new markets, uh, creating better market intelligence and creating better understanding of these new markets so that we can educate ourselves and our industry better so we can better make changes and adapt and make investments being able to attract uh, more private capital to invest into the industry is a a, a great need and um, what PIC is doing can be a really important part of helping to serve as a real catalyst and helping really build a new ecosystem around the crop that can take us into this new future. So to wrap up, you know, I take a look at it as canola 3.0, the next 20 years, really driven around protein. We really need to pay attention to these end use markets and how they're changing. If you want to participate, we need to be able to really better uh, uh, explain our story around our sustainable intensification. We need the global scale. We need to be a low cost producer. That doesn't mean we need to be a low margin producer, but we need to be a low cost producer. So everything that we've got going on around driving yield and pr productivity is going to remain very, very key for us. So again, to kind of wrap up into the future, I believe it's protein driven, both into the food industry, into high value feed, and maybe even being able to do things like making the crop easier to, easier to process, bringing in different process technologies can be very valuable in helping to unlock the value that's within uh, that crop that we call canola. Thank you very much and I hope you have a great conference. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm not sure if I'm on live now. Um, if uh, Christine could let me know through chat, that, that would be great. Um, I'll be handling the, uh, the question and answer uh, portion, portion here. And there's a number of questions uh, that came forward. Uh, some of them I'll have to uh, combine to, together. Um, and uh, the first question uh, would go to... Um, Curtis Rempel, uh, and it's a it's a fairly general question, but uh, I would ask you to uh, try and uh, summarize it in a in a few in a few minutes, if if possible. Um, it uh, it refers to uh, uh, question is what uh, management strategies are currently used to control club root and black lake, and what impact do these uh, diseases? Uh, have on yield. Curtis, could you uh, answer the question, please? Oh, sure. I'd be happy to start, but I think uh, maybe Kelly, uh, Dr. Turkington wants to jump in as well on, on this as he's the disease expert. But um, in terms of overall management, um, the management practices are very similar. First of all, um, we recommend and, and, uh, and it's anchored by scouting for disease. So you have whether you're a farmer or commercial agronomist, you have to know what you have in your field. And that's predicated on scouting and testing. Second part of the strategy would be um, reducing spore load or what the scientists would call inoculum. And your first, um, your first strategy uh, action would be crop rotation. 
So, uh, and there's multiple benefits of crop rotation, but uh, clearly reducing disease inoculum, whether it's soil borne or stubble borne is, is a big uh, factor. And then from there on in with club root, it's, uh, there's a, a number of strategies that we have for, for keeping your soil at home, managing the patches, et cetera, et cetera. So there, that's too, there's, they're, they're too extensive to, to explain uh, in a few short minutes. And with black leg, of course, um, besides scouting crop rotation, there's, uh, there's management of black leg genetics now. That's, your, that's a, a, a key tool. Um, Kelly, do you want to, uh, you want to throw in your... Sense. Yeah, sure. Certainly, uh, Curtis. Excellent points. Uh, you know, I can't emphasize enough the importance of in-crop scouting to look for issues. And uh, my first experience with sort of a lack of this was uh, black leg in the Peace region of Alberta when I was a postdoc there. I worked with Don Woods, can a canola breeder on brown girdling root rot. And, and we were out surveying for root rot and happened to come across a couple fields with a few suspicious looking plants. Whereas the third field that we came, uh, came to was literally like walking into a field in the Melfort Star City uh, region of Saskatchewan in the early 80s. So being on top of the issues that are developing, uh, looking at your varieties that you're growing, uh, Curtis touched on the importance of rotation. Uh, that's a foundational strategy. Uh, unfortunately, the, the rotational length, you know, you're probably looking at a three to four year rotation at least. Uh, the challenge there is that in many cases, our rotations are not that long and typically they may be a serial canola serial rotation. So that means our our strategies then are largely falling on host resistance. Uh, that's doing the, the lion's share of the, the, the workload as far as uh, uh, managing that. The problem is that pathologists across the Prairie region uh, with uh, universities, with Ag Canada and so on are, are, you know, are finding shifts in virulence, which is concerning. But again, there are tools that are available that can help to try and mitigate some of that including uh, the resistance uh, labeling on varieties. So a producer can change up the varieties they grow and the resistance uh, sources they're using. Uh, in addition, you now have availability of uh, uh, crop residue testing for black leg, which can identify the, the pathotypes that a farmer has, and then they can base use that information to base uh, their variety choice on. Uh, club root, uh, we're a bit behind on that in that particular area. And talking with with uh, Clint Yerke, uh, there there are initiatives related to identifying pathotypes of the club root pathogen and perhaps providing testing services, but those are are largely in the research realm at this particular time. Um, you know, in you know, if you look at other options, certainly tillage is often. Uh, mentioned as a as sort of a more of a traditional disease management tool. Quite frankly, the research would suggest, and even observations, that tillage is not a very very good strategy for disease management. Uh, the one aspect of tillage that is of concern is in terms of soil particle dispersal, which may actually carry the club root pathogen. So, uh, you know, largely across the western uh, or prairie region, we're in a direct seeding situation. So, you know, there are other uh, uh, control strategies, but one that often is overlooked is the control of uh, volunteers and weed hosts that uh, those can be important reservoirs for uh, both these pathogens. So making sure you've got uh, an excellent weed control program will be important. And, and you touched on patch management and there's other things in terms of uh, field access points for club root, but uh, yeah, no, certainly starting with knowledge regarding what your situation is on your farm will be key. Okay, thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, we have a question now for uh, Frederic Bissonnette, and uh, uh, it's, it's regarding, again, it's kind of soil related, uh, and it's a fairly technical question. Does the width of the VF, VFS strip safeguarding surface water, does this depend on the type of soil, sandy versus clay? And, and does it also depend on the type of vegetation? Uh, 
Uh, you're on mute. Uh, you're you're muted, Frederick. Okay, we'll skip to another question, if that's okay, while we get these technical questions uh, addressed. So uh, we'll we'll get back to that question. Uh, Larissa, could you unmute yourself, please? All right, thank you. Okay, this is related to your uh, question related to FBN's uh, business model. And uh, the question is whether it's a true co-op set, set up or, um, or is it a company that uses a membership type model? Well, that's a, a, a great question. <laughs> um, I, I think it's a, a little bit of both, but I would actually love to uh, connect that person one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, someone that's a, a little bit more familiar to the model, but we are interested in, I would say, in both options where it's a, a membership or a, as a true co-op partner. So that's a 50-50 answer. All right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm only a month in. So. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Frederick, are you ready to go? No, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so there's some questions for myself uh, regarding the Western Canada Canola Rapeseed Recommending Committee. So I'll provide some fill here and some information regarding the committee and what other attributes it evaluates beyond oil, protein, saturates, and glucosinolates. At the same time that these components are uh, assembled from field data, we also take information on uh, and record uh, yield, yield uh, days to maturity, days to first flower, uh, lodging, uh, lodging resistance. And uh, we also manage a fairly extensive uh, Black Lake evaluation pro program. So those are the, uh, the quality parameters are what recommends a canola variety. Uh, however, at the same time, we are uh, collecting and, uh, uh, and publishing uh, that agronomic uh, data uh, in our yearly, re yearly report. In terms of the other diseases, uh, club root, uh, uh, fus fusarium wilt, uh, verticillium, longisporum, and so on. Uh, the committee fulfills a role of uh, provide of having a, a quite extensive uh, uh, subcommittee structure, whereby all these uh, issues are evaluated and considered, and uh, and. Um, and, and indeed, uh, re research meth methodologies are developed to address them. So many of those me methodologies reside uh, as, as uh, for information purposes within the WCCRC, but in terms of evaluating the cultivar for recommendation, uh, that's outside the parameters of the uh, WCCRC. Uh, let's see. And this, uh, this uh, is a question for Corey. And um, I don't know if you're online, Corey, or not, uh, or someone from SAS Canola can address this, or anyone can feel free to jump in. They, uh, the question is regarding uh, the survey numbers related to the level of canola grown uh, in their respective regions. Um, and did those samples truly reflect the distribution of canola grown across the province? No answers. All right. All right. This is a question from uh, Sally, Sally Vale for Delaney. Delaney, are you online? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I can hear you. Thank you. Great. Uh, so Delaney, um, Sally's questions regarding is regarding your projects looking at cultivar dif differences uh, for flooding flooding tolerance uh, as part of the extreme moisture initiative. Uh, so is it just hybrids that are being looked at, or or are diverse breeding lines or even other brassica species being assessed? Oh, that's a 
great question and much deeper into that project than I think I'm familiar with. Um, I, I don't imagine there's limitations in terms of what they're looking into, but I could connect with Sally on that one too, uh, to properly answer. I apologize, I, I, don't, uh, I, I don't know that specific project that well. Okay. Um, uh, now this question would, would be for Dave Diziak, um, and I'm not quite sure who it's from. Um, could you comment on uh, the progress on uh, the human use of canola meal as a, as a sor source of vegetable protein or vegetable protein for human use, I guess? <laughs> Sure. Um, <clears throat> from um, what I understand, you've got people like, uh, say, Merit in Winnipeg, Merit Foods and DSM over in Europe, where they're actually taking canola meal and then really doing um, a, a bunch of separations and isolations to pull out um, pretty high quality canola protein isolates out of that type of a product. I'm not aware of anybody that's found a good way to take actual canola meal and put it into food yet. Um, but that'll be a bit of a trick. Hopefully that answers the question. Uh, kind of. So it's a bit of a trick. Is there any progress in that area? I think it's going to be fairly difficult. You know, there's a lot of uh, things in canola meal that just don't taste that great. And it's a pretty fibrous, you know, product. Um, actually, I'm also aware of a company, I think in Finland or in Scandinavia, that's uh, creating something called black grain, where I think they're trying to take the uh, looking more at the fiber and trying to put that into some food formulations. But I don't know how successful they've been. They've been with it. But I think it's going to be a bit of a, um, a bit of a trip yet to actually take canola meal and be able to use that directly into, into many food formulations. So as a, just to briefly continue on that, uh, there was a question here. Is, is, there, uh, is it feasible to put a plant in Atlantic Canada in this regard? You know, there's a little bit of canola growing out there, but probably not enough to that would supply any kind of a processing facility. And yeah. typically the economics of this thing kind of work that you tend to build the processing near where the crop is grown. So you're not moving, you know, bulk commodity a long, long distance. So um, despite the fact I really enjoy Atlantic Canada, it's probably unlikely that we'll see a canola processing plant out there anytime soon. Right. So it would probably be centered in the center of pre uh, predominantly, I guess the best chances would be in Western Canada where most of the production is, correct? It, yeah, exactly. So you've yeah. got good access to raw material and then you're shipping out, you know, more value added dense product versus uh, moving uh, raw material. Okay, I think I've covered the 15 minutes there uh, and um, my apologies. Uh, it, there, uh, a, a fairly large number of questions came in uh, and I, I tried to uh, uh, put some of the questions together as one question. So uh, I guess I'm closing out the meeting today. Uh, so on, on, behalf of, on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, and I would like to thank uh, all the sponsors and all the presenters uh, for taking the time and effort and uh, and uh, bringing your adaptive strategies forward as we, we deal with this new way of working and this uh, response to, uh, to COVID. Um, and I think it's uh, telling that uh, uh, ourselves, like other, like other industries and companies and uh, just families, uh, uh, we're showing that uh, we're able to get through this situation uh, through new ideas and uh, new ways of doing things. So uh, again, I would like to thank uh, thank everyone, and I uh, can't obviously can't list them all. So I'd like to close out the meeting uh, today, and I would also like you to to take the opportunity to uh, to go uh, to make your way to the networking lounge. Um, and uh, where you'll have the opportunity to discuss with colleagues and to uh, um, 
and to uh, have some of these more uh, detailed questions uh, um, answered uh, for you in the networking lounge. Uh, so that concludes the uh, meeting for today. Again, uh, th uh, thank you all. Uh, and uh, please make your way to the networking lounge and, uh, and make some friends, uh, new friends uh, and old friends too. Uh, and uh, that's, that's it for the day. Thank you. Thanks, Raymond. See you. Yeah, see you.